One of those things that are my greatest memories as a child was when I was in school. Went to Dunn Avenue School, 1956, Miss Rowley's class uh, in the first grade. Very nice school, very uh, nice woman back in those days. Teachers dressed up every day like they were going to church. And I remember my mother and father getting me ready for that first day of school. And I had on my, my black and brown Oxfords and my short britches and my book satchel, as we called it, a little thing we carried our book with the big fat pencil and the big tablet with the big lines in between. Well, one of the things I enjoyed most about first grade was we got to stand up and say, and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I mean, you know, I'd never really said the Pledge of Allegiance. I imagine at some point in time I may have heard it on television or something like that. We may have done it at Vacation Bible School. But to stand up at, beside my desk and put my hand over my heart and say I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, I know, of course, in the first grade, we didn't say it that articulate because I can pretty much tell you that we probably said the new United States and, um, and, and, and several other things uh, that uh, we didn't say right, but we did know one nation under God. And that being said, it was impressed upon us at an early age that God had something to do with our nation. It seems that these days we are trying to make a separation between God and the nation, between he who is our creator, our personal creator, the creator of the family, the creator of society, the creator of community, the creator of man. For some reason we are trying to separate him, not realizing that he is also the creator of all authority and thus the creator of this nation. We have all through history men saying that it is obvious that God intended for this to be a nation. I think I may have said this to you the last time I, last time I was here. As you study the history of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, Crispus Adams and, and many addicts and many others uh, who were that hodgepodge group of people, constructs and and farmers and pilgrims and colonialists and, and educated men, but all of those men, all of them had theological degrees. Every last one of them who were educated, their degree was theological. In essence, they were trained in religion. I say all that simply to say that George Washington, if my information is correct, if I'm quoting him right or wrong, I know what the spirit of what he said was, that God intended for this to be a nation. This man was a military man and knew that he won battle after battle that he was not supposed to win. That he came up against the superpower of the world at that particular time, the British Empire. And that they had the best Navy, the best trained men, the best equipment. They had the best of everything. And America, the colonists who had declared independence, had the best of nothing. What they had was a determination and a vision and a belief that God was with them, that their secret weapon was not their muskets, it was not in their cannons, it was not in their few uh, little boats that they were able to build or the money that they got from France, that their secret weapon was God. That was their secret weapon. And when we think about this and we look at the conflicts that we've been in, we weren't supposed to win the Revolutionary War, but it was won. It was won, and it was won in a decisive fashion. Somebody said that the Civil War, where we fought north and south, black and white, uh, different philosophies, that it was supposed to tear the nation apart. But a man stood up and said that that government of the people by the people and for the people shall not perish from this earth. And in that beautiful speech, he basically gave the character of a nation. And that is a nation that refuses to die and refuses to disappear. It was said that other wars from 1812 to even the World War I 
when men got on boats and went to Europe to fight uh, for a uh, freedom. There was a song that was sung in World War I, over there, over there, and we won't be back over until it's over, over there. And our men and women went and fought and suffered in order to maintain freedom. In World War II, after Pearl Harbor was attacked, on December 7th, Roosevelt went on radio and said it would be a day that would live in infamy. infamy. But he said something that impresses me as a amateur historian, thanks to my father who loved history and impressed it upon me. He said, he, he said, made a, a, a term he called the righteous might, the righteous might of the United States. And when we think about this, the relevance of all of this is when we talk about one nation, we are very rapidly becoming a nation that is extremely wealthy. We've got the best army on the planet, the best Air Force, the Marines, the Coast Guard, the Navy, Civil Air Patrol, and other ancillary and adjunct services. We have the best people, men and women, anywhere. But too often, in America, like many other places in the world, and many other superpowers that have risen and fallen, you know, we have all of this stuff to fight with. But too often, many Americans right now are forgetting what we fight for. And because of this, we're not saying one nation under God in many school systems right now, because the boards of education and the superintendents <clears throat> The politicians and pundits and those individuals in control have decided that that's not pertinent in a society like ours, a modern progressive society. So to say one nation under God is offensive to many people. We're taking the Bible already out of the courtrooms and taking the Bible out of the schools. And basically what we're doing in this one nation that was started by the power and grace and mercy of God, we're trying to remove God from the marketplace. And you know, there are a lot of folks around the world who still call this the American experiment because what they're saying is that a nation that's based on the religious principles and the writings of the scripture and the belief in a higher power and a greater morality and a greater set of principles than those things that man can dream up most certainly can't last forever. So there are those in Europe who still call America the American experiment because their nations are so old, they've got buildings that are older than America, and they expect us to falter, and they expect us to fall. And you know what, brothers and sisters? It can happen if we start forgetting who we are, whose we are, and why we are. We are one nation under God. Folks want to take in God we trust off of our money. They want to remove crosses from the cemetery that, that stand in a dignified fashion over our men and women who have given their last measure of devotion and died on the battlefield. There are those who are saying, I'm offended by that cross that stands over their graves. We have allowed ourselves to fall into an environment of ignorance. And you know, the scriptures tell us very clearly, men love darkness because their deeds are evil. And the evil deeds of men are becoming a temptation in this one nation under God being driven by the politicians that are elected that don't put the public good above their political agenda. And because of this, we are changing just a little bit every time. I used to hear, and I know he didn't originate it because I've heard it all over the place, you don't have to let the cow in the gate, just let him get his nose in the fence and he gets his nose in the fence, eventually he'll get inside because a little bit at a time, he'll push his whole body through that fence. 
This is what we have watched happening, a little leaven, leavening the whole lump, evil communication being pressed in with those things that are irreverent, those things that are unsavory, perverted, corrupted, those things that are ungodly. We are that evil communication of pressed close together corrupts good manners. We got to understand something. We are man. We are a living soul, not just a living creature. We're not something sniffing around in the dirt, hunting rocks, pulling up roots, or going to the bottom of a pond looking for something dead and stinking to eat. God formed us, formed us from the dust of the ground and breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. We're not just living creatures, but we are a living soul because God made us in his image and made us in his likeness. But your adversary who hates the ground you walk on, the air you breathe, because he can't have it, wants you to lose what God so freely gave you. His love, mercy, and justice wants you to violate God and break his heart. Was able to come into that garden of Eden from the Hebrew pleasantness where God had made the man and opened up his side and removed the rib and from that rib had made the woman and brought her to his side, indicating she's not his slave nor his master but his helpmate. And in that beautiful pair, to separate them with pride and temptation to the extent that they left their God and violated the law of God that they both clearly stated that they understood that God said not the tree in the mist, because if you do, you shall surely die. The devil, as you know, tempted man just as he tempts us today. He tempts man with the most powerful weapon that has ever been used, a lie, a lie. The first and most diabolical lie that has ever been told was told on that day, you won't die, you won't die, you can't believe what God is saying, you can't trust what God is saying, come on Adam, come on Eve, God just don't want you to reach your potential. He don't want you to rise to where you can rise and be what you can be. He don't want you to shine and roar and be powerful. The same lie he tells women today and men today to break up families and have unraised, ungodly children in a community that has turned its back on its benefactor. In him, we live, we move, and we have our being in God, in God who we trust. We live, move, and have our being. Eve and Adam, death is brought on them. As the Apostle Paul explained in the book of Romans, death is brought up on them. And from that point, just as God says, the, the God, the promise maker, is the promise keeper. God is not slack concerning his promises. If he promised it, he can carry it out. He don't have to figure out a way to do it. It's already been done when God makes the promise. And death is brought on man. And since that day, the greatest mass murderer of all times, the devil, because everybody that dies, every heart that stops beating, Every lung, set of lungs that stop billowing, every eye that closes in death is because of the mass murderer called the devil who told that lie that brought death on mankind. Once uh, during one of our conflicts, Colin Powell made a statement that I told you the last time I was here. So pardon the redundancy. He said that the first casualty of war is the truth. The truth, that's the first casualty. The first thing that goes in war is the truth. Because neither side wants the other side to know what they're doing. So propaganda goes back and forth and back and forth. Because the first casualty is the truth. Nobody speaks the truth in the midst of war. 
In World War II, Tokyo Rose spread propaganda. In the Vietnam War, Hanoi Hannah spread propaganda. And all over the internet today, we have young men and women being radicalized to the point that they hate. And some have even taken the life of their own parents because they have been fed lies. Because a lie is so potent and always been the devil's greatest weapon. So when we talk about one nation, brothers and sisters, under God, we got to realize that we are a nation that has been blessed by God. But just as Adam and Eve turned around and turned their back on God and his law, many today are doing the same thing. We are held accountable. We're not like the dogs and the cats and the lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. We're, that's not us. We're human beings. We have a soul that lives eternally. And we will be held accountable. Like Brother Keeble used to say, we're not like old Rover dead all over. That Bible lets me know that the rich men who had misused Lazarus are not taking care of him. The Bible says in hell, he lifted up his eyes. Why? Because he wasn't going to go into oblivion and darkness. But because he has a living soul, he is held accountable. He is a free moral nation, a free moral agent. God held him accountable. And we can have eternal life or we can have eternal death. Why? We are a free moral agent. And all of us, no matter what our profession is, we can turn our backs on God and do that which is wrong. Peter said one time in the book of 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 8 that I probably quote every sermon I preach because it is pertinent to the foundation of the lesson that all of us have got to get. You have an enemy. You have an opponent. You have someone that is destined and determined to see you destroyed and see you turn your back on that one God and who has gave, given us so much. Peter said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, he calls his name the devil, as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. According to Peter, the devil has one job, your destruction. He has one mission, your devouring. He has one goal, your death. What will make him happy? God having to look at someone he loves with tears in his eyes, if you'll let me use anthropomorphism, with tears in his eyes and say, get out of my face. Depart from me. Depart from me. Depart from me. In the 50 years of preaching, I have seen so many parents whose children were either caught up in criminal activity or drug abuse, that they became so dangerous to the family and their other siblings and the household that that parent had to put them out. With tears in their eyes and broken heart, they had to say, you can't come back. You're not welcome here anymore. And I've seen that over and over and over. And for God to have to tell us that one day, Jesus said, not everyone that said unto me, Lord, Lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. What is the Lord saying? The Lord's saying, I love you. I love everybody. I love all of you. I gave my life while you were yet sinners. Christ died for us. In the golden text of the Bible, in the book of John chapter 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have life. What's God's intent? God's intent. And as the New Testament writer writes and lets us know, God is not willing that any should perish. God don't want any of us to be lost. Because God wants us to be saved. But the devil is intent 
on your destruction. What James says in the gospel of common sense, which is what James' book is often called. James said, don't blame God. It's not God's fault. Don't say God did it to you. Don't say if I'd been born this, if I'd been born rich, if I'd been born tall, if I'd been born black, if I'd been born white, if I'd been born in a certain part of the world, if I'd been, it's not God's fault. Don't say I had to work hard, that, that I didn't get the education I wanted. Don't go making up all those excuses for the sin and temptation that has pulled you away from your God. James said, let no man, no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Because James says, God, God does not tempt man with evil. He doesn't do this. He is not tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and is enticed. Then James went on to say in verses 15, then when lust hath conceived, when, it, when that baby is born, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. The devil wants to plant the seed in us personally, and he wants to plant the seed in our nation to where we turn and we stop being that one nation under God. When we turn away from our secret weapon, God, when we turn our back on our history and what God did for us when nobody else could do it. John said one time, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. John said, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If we're going to be that one nation under God, then what we've got to do is what Peter said to the brethren before he got to verses 8. What we have right now is a nation of arrogance and, inner, and, and self-dependence. We have folks who interlope inside of our nation, and they don't have any type of skin in the game or commitment to what this nation is and what it has to do in order to be uh, to continue to be a nation. Peter said to the brethren, to the church, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and verses 7, Peter said, humble yourselves, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. When we humble ourselves and we realize that God is our benefactor, when we humble ourselves and realize that we can't be a great nation without God, when we humble ourselves and stop allowing folks to make public policy and electing politicians who don't have our values and our beliefs and share our faith, when we humble ourselves and understand that everything that we have is a gift of God. He said, casting all your cares upon him, your concerns, your fears, your issues, because he cares for you. Lord, what if America went back to being that nation that prayed, that nation that believed in the scripture, that nation where on Sunday morning the streets were clear because folks were in church now we've passed a bill because there are those who've come from other parts of the country who don't share the values that we have in the Bible Belt, and they are effectively unbuckling the Bible Belt one piece, one notch at a time. Now you're going to have liquor sales on Sunday. You can't buy enough whiskey on Saturday to get you over to Sunday. Now you can go to the liquor store and buy it on Sunday morning. So you're going to have folks who wouldn't set foot in church, but they're going to spend a whole lot of time in the liquor store walking through the large assortments of wines and liquors and whiskeys that, that you're going to have right here in the state of Tennessee. Why? Because there are those who have a political agenda does not in, that does not include your values 
and your beliefs and your faith. And they intend to press this stuff down your throat and there is absolutely nothing that you can do about it. At least that's what they believe. Paul said to us one time in the book of Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and verses 12, Paul said to the brethren, he said, the grace of God, the grace of God, not your army, not your air force, not your educated men, not your college professors and scientists, not your corporate heads, not your folks over that create all the technology in the valley. He said, the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we, we, we as Americans, we as Tennesseans, we as members of the Lord's church, that we, should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. What we have are those who are doing everything they can to make you breach and violate that solemn oath to you, that you have to your God and Father who sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. And he suffered in his passion, took our beating as our perpetuation, and hung on the cross between the twilights of two worlds with a thief on the right and a thief on the left. But there are those who are telling you that that's, in, that's not important in today's marketplace. Too many of us are looking at those things other than the character of our politicians. We are not looking at whether or not they respect life. What we have is a genocide going on in this nation that didn't start because we voted on it in the church. It's there because somebody voted on it in Congress. They voted on it in the Senate. They voted on it in the Supreme Court. It was signed by political leaders and now it's legal to kill babies. And by the millions, this silent genocide goes on. Why? Why? It goes on because of politics. In a nation under God, it's okay to kill the unborn. In a nation under God, it's okay to violate the family, to violate God's edict from the very beginning. When he made Adam, he looked at Adam, he had already made an assessment of the whole world. And God said it's good. He looked at the oceans, good. He looked at the trees, the land, the grass, the firmament, the sun, the moon, the animals that crawled and ran and flew and swam. And he said, good. Yea, very good. There was only one thing that God said wasn't good. He looked at Adam by himself, even in paradise, and said, that's not good. It's not good that man should be alone. So God made him a helpmate, as I said a moment ago. He put him in a deep sleep. God, when Adam woke up and he looked at Eve, because God is the father of the bride, created the family. God is the father of the bride, created marriage. God as the father of the man and the woman gave us those individuals that make up a union that is sanctioned by the creator. Adam looked at Eve and said, now she is bones of my bones. She is flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Esha because she was taken out of each. In essence, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then Adam gives us the principle. For this reason shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife. And they, they, a man and a woman, they, a male and a female, they, as God created them, they leave father and mother, cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. God never said that two of the same were to be one flesh, nor are they capable of being one flesh. When we look common sense 
tells us they can't be one flesh. Don't take a college degree to know this, but you know what? There are politicians who say they can because they have voted on it in the seats of Congress, in the seats of the Senate, in the seats of the Supreme Court, and it's been signed by great men that a man can wrap himself up in duct tape, put fruit inside of a brazier, put on a wig and a woman's dress, and call himself a woman, and legally, according to the folks in this one nation under God. There are teachers that if Bubba come to school on Friday, but he was Bubba on Thursday, but he Brenda on Friday, the teacher can be fired for not calling Bubba Brenda. Bubba 6'5", 350 pounds, looked like a gorilla, but you, want, you gotta call him Brenda. Why? Because the law say so. Because the law say so. And with this one nation under God, we've got to start thinking about these things. And you've got to look at the people that we choose. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verses 22, when the apostle Paul is talking about ordaining elders, the principle is still the same. Paul said, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partakers or participants of other man's sins. Keep thyself pure. In other words, don't vote for folks that you know are going to do things that violate God's law. Well, Brother Deberry, look at the folks that are there now. There are sinners all over the place. Well, here's the deal. David was a politician, and David sinned with Bathsheba. Solomon was a politician, and Solomon sinned in many ways and with a thousand women. Abraham was a politician, and he went into the slave tent. All of those men, we can look at all of them all through the Old and New Testament. We can look at Paul, a politician, and he killed Christians. Peter denied the Lord. We're not going to find but one perfect man in this book. His name is Jesus. Jesus, who knew no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. So what do we do, Brother D. Barry? You find the person that has not openly declared war against God. That's what you do. You find the person who has not openly declared that they're going to remove the Bible from the marketplace. You find the person who has not openly declared that they're going to support late-term abortion. You find the person who has not openly declared that they're going to support the progressive agenda. You find the person who has not openly declared that they're going to work to destroy the biblical standard of ethics and morality. You find the person who has not openly declared that they're going to bring marriage equality, which means homosexual marriage. And you find that person, and you may have to hold your nose to push the button, but you know what the alternative is. And when we think about this, brothers and sisters, in the political realm, that's exactly what we have to do. And then we have to be active and assert our authority, our righteous might, as the moral majority. In 2 John chapter 9 and verses 11, John gave us the principle. He said, whosoever, congressmen, whosoever, not senators, whosoever. What about presidents? Whosoever. What about folks sitting on the Supreme Court? Whosoever. What about state legislators? Whosoever. What about the state senate? Whosoever. What about school superintendents? Whosoever, John said, transgress it and abide it not in the doctrine of Christ. Notice what he said, hath not God. You are not on God's side. He that abided in the doctrine of Christ, he had both the Father and the Son. And then John gave us a, a little bit better advice. He said, if any, if any, I don't care where he served. I don't care about the prefixes and suffixes on his name. He said, if any come unto you and bring not this doctrine. 
He said, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. Every now and then you got to open our eyes. You got to listen to people. Not get caught up in their ability to speak and their charisma. Every now and then you got to listen to the words. Every now and then you got to look at the character. Are you going to find flaws? Yes. Sins? Absolutely. Mistakes? Yes. Whole lot of people have done a whole lot of bad stuff. But you listen as to whether or not that person has declared war on God. And the one that you see that has declared war on God, you don't vote for him. You don't vote for him. It's just that simple. That is a command from God. He that bidded him God speed is a protector. Well, Brother D. Barry, I just believe we have to protect our Medicare. And Brother D. Barry, I just believe we're supposed to protect our Social Security. And Brother D. Barry, I just believe, I, I, want, I want some folks to fight for racial equality. Well, you know, Brother D. Barry, you know, uh, this is American. I, I'm, I want to make sure folks are taking care of the veterans. You know what? I'll trade all of that, every bit of it. I get rid of Social Security, Medicare, and any other entitlements if we would stop killing babies tomorrow. And at some point, we have to give account to God as to what we supported and why. Well, God, you know, I, I, I just felt like I, I just had to have uh, uh, these, these, I just had to have that stuff. And, and, you know, they promised me, yeah, but they told you they were going to kill babies and that they were going to destroy marriage and they were going to tear up the home. And they were going to do things that I absolutely forbid, stuff I burned Sodom and Gomorrah to the ground for. Things that I wiped the whole earth clean and saved only eight souls for. In James chapter 4 and verse 7, James said, Submit, submit, submit yourselves unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. God didn't tell us to run from the devil. God told us to put the devil on the run. And if we will stand together and speak together and vote together and fight together, you can have your Medicare and your Social Security and your veterans. All you got to do is find men and women and hold their feet to the fire and make sure that they do the will of God as God has commanded. Paul was called Saul of Tarsus, a young politician educated at the feet of Gamaliel, a young man who had was educated at the University of Tarsus. But you know this man lost himself. He lost himself because he got caught up in his pride and his agenda. At 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 6 through verses 8, the Apostle Paul talking to the brethren at Thessalonica said, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober, for they that sleep, sleep in the night, or sleep in ignorance, and sleep in darkness, and they be drunken, are drunken in the night. And then he says in verses 8, but let us who are of the day, those who can see, those who understand what's really going on, those who understand that God's not happy, those who understand that Jesus is coming back one day, and as Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes, let us hear the conclusion to the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Why, Solomon? For God shall bring every work into the judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. We have too many politicians who have sold out. They've sold out. They've already sold out. We deal with them every day. They've sold out. When time comes, it's not about the principles. I said to a young man one time who was sitting in front of me in one of our committees, and I know we're about the same age, 
And he was saying some things, and I tapped him on the shoulders. And I said, how long are you going to violate your principles? How long, how long are you going to violate the things your mama? I said, I know your mama and daddy didn't teach you the stuff you're saying here today. I know you weren't raised to believe the stuff that you are espousing here. Another representative looked over me and said, leave him alone, leave him alone. I said, let him fight his own battles. But I got all over him because I know that he was selling out. He was doing what he had to do to get reelected rather than standing like a man and saying those things that are right. The Lord said one time in the book of Matthew, when he spoke in chapter 16 and verses 26, the Lord said, what, what does it profit a man? What have you profited? If you gain the whole world and lose your own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? America needs to ask, have we sold our soul? Have we gone down the moral elevator? Have we allowed the politics of the day to dictate our morals rather than our morals dictating our politics? Have we allowed the politics of our day to tell us how to raise our children rather than us telling our politicians what we absolutely will not accept? Have we told the politicians what we don't want them being taught in school? They remove the Bible and replace it with books that tells our children that they came from monkeys and beasts and amoebas. You can't tell them that God created them, but you can tell them that they evolved over a billion years from a monkey. And that makes sense to certain people. What does it profit if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 4 and verses 34, Solomon said, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Are we folks who have become a reproach before God? One of the prophets said one time, were they ashamed when they committed abomination? Were they ashamed? He says, no, they weren't ashamed. Neither did they blush. Here recently, a municipal government determined that you can't make a woman keep her top on if you're not going to make men keep theirs on. So in that particular city, just as a man would run down the street with his gym shorts on, a woman can do the same, and there is nothing anybody can do about it because those are the decisions that the politicians have made. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 16, 13, Paul said, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. My brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, we got to realize something. We got to put on the whole armor of God that we will be able to stand against the wiles, the tricks, the lies, the deceptions of the devil. Paul said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You're not fighting people. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And Paul gives us the armory to protect our hearts and protect our minds and protect our souls and protect our faith and protect our morality, protect our principles, protect our integrity so that this nation, all of these babies, and Jonathan's holding his baby, what kind of nation are we going to have 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, if we don't turn this stuff around right now. What type of nation are your grandchildren going to grow up in? That your children are going to grow up in if we don't turn it around right now? The Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 14 that we be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro carried about with every wind and doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. There was a young man who had an accident. If I told you about this when I was here before, then just forgive me. And he lay in his bed for 12 years 
in a coma. 12 years, he lay in that bed in a coma. For 12 years, folks came in the room and talked about him like he wasn't there. His mother came in and talked about how miserable she was to have to take care of his every need and take care of his every body function and wash him and clothe him and feed him. For 12 years, he lay there with folks coming in and out of the room like he wasn't even in the room, like he was a non-person, a non-entity. You know, that's what we're doing to God right now in America. We're acting like God doesn't even exist. We're talking about the scripture and his son and his principles like God doesn't even exist. What's got to happen is we've got to be men and women who, first of all, teach folks again how to hear that which is true. Let them know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We've got to find men and women who will stand and let folks know you've got to believe those things written in God's book divine. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. We've got to be folks who let folks know you're not going to be saved unless you repent of your sins and acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God and put him on in the water of grave of baptism. We've got to be folks who let the church know that we've got to be strong, live right, and give God everything that we got. The church stands, the nation stands, if we stand. We've got to stand by faith, Rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We've got to stand, not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We've got to stand in the gospel declared and preached to us by the Apostle Paul. We must stand watching and being strong and acting like men. We must stand in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Stand full clad in the whole armor of God. Stand with one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. When we stand and we fight and we speak and we pray and we hold on, this one nation under God can still be that nation it was in 1956 when a first grader put his hand over his heart and says, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the new United States of America. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we started appreciating what God gave us again and stopped letting folks water down our blessings? Thank y'all for listening to a long lesson. Let us stand.